Roger uh, is going to be talking to us shortly and taking us through the uh, decision process and uh, how that was arrived at. Uh, Jan is going to take us through, as he has done so many times before, all of that geotechnical information. I'll be taking you through uh, some information around the Section 124s, which are part of the responsibility of the Christchurch City Council. Ivan Yafeta will be talking about support and assistance and also taking us through the offers that will be uh, available to you. And then Roger is going to sum up at the end of that process. And what I would like you to do, please, is to hold all of the questions until we get through the whole presentation so that you've got the full context. Once we've done that and we get into the Q&A, we're very happy to go back to any of the earlier parts that uh, you might need a bit of extra information around, and that'll be the Q&A session. We've got a whole pile of uh, staff and support people here, and they are arranged around the room. Obviously, uh, we've got CIRA. Uh, the City Council is over there for more detailed questions around the 124s. EQC is here as well. I see we've got the insurers represented uh, down the back of the room. The stronger Christchurch infrastructure rebuild team are here, as well as the uh, temporary accommodation service. We've got the uh, support coordinators as well. We've got the Salvation Army. And uh, did we have the Red Cross here as well? Anyway, to all of those support groups that have come along tonight, uh, we want to thank you for being here. So. Let's uh, move into the first part of the uh, process and uh, we'll uh, ask Roger to come and join us. We're going to go through the uh, process that surrounds the uh, decision makings. So Roger, welcome along. We'll give him a round of applause. Yet another night out on the town. Right. Welcome. Well, it's really it's, um, good to be back here in Sumner. But first of all, I wanted to start off with um, um, really an apology for how long it's taken us to get to decisions. For some of you, you don't have a decision um, yet. Um, I guess when we set ourselves a date of getting zoning decisions out by the end of June, um, we thought we would get there. We haven't quite got there. Um, when I say haven't quite got there, there's still 160 people who are still waiting for a decision. And within all the people who have got a decision, there's a lot of you who don't like your decision as well. Um, and I guess on that is we're going to try and talk about tonight about that decision. Um, how we got to those decisions, but also to say there will be um, some sort of an appeals process. On the flat land, there's an appeals process which is being overseen by a guy called uh, Keith Turner, who's um, an engineer. So on the flat land, we've got an appeals process, and on the, on the hill land, as this is, there will also be an appeals process as well, the details of which we haven't yet worked out. Um, the other thing I wanted to apologise for was Friday. Um, I know a lot of you waited by your computers to watch um, the, the live streaming of what was happening and that didn't work very well at all. Um, the website was um, appalling as well um, and we put people through a lot of stress. Um, we didn't wake up in the morning wanting to put people through stress but we did and I'm really sorry for that. I think we caused a lot of people a lot of distress. So look, I'm just going to, I'm just going to maybe just talk a bit about the context here. So this was the decisions here have been very much based on, if you like, the geotech advice from, from the geotech engineers. Um, we work closely with the council. Um, as I've said, these decisions aren't going aren't to please everybody. They're going to please some people, but they're not going to please everyone. Mitigation. Um, we'll talk more about mitigation, but mitigation, when it came to the rock roll, for people at this life risk of up to one in a thousand, was we weren't able to we weren't we weren't able to satisfy ourselves with any mitigation that was going to be that was going to work in a cost-effective way that was going to be timely and was also that was just going to work as well. And Jan can talk a bit more about that, but I'm also happy to talk more about that. I want to talk about that at the end. So 1,100 properties were zoned green, 1,107, um, 285 went red. Um, 158 properties are, are white with rock roll issues. Eight are in this area called Lucas Lane where they've got some really complex geotech issues we're still not at the bottom of and we want to get them a decision by the end of October. Um, I think that's, I don't need to talk more about that. So three big issues. The first issue was, was the cliff collapse. 
And cliff collapse is pretty much an on-off decision. It's, it's, quite, it's relatively easy. And what we decided there was where GNS, who brought together all the engineering and all the science, judged there was a risk of someone dying in the next bloody big shake, they zoned the place red. Where there was no risk of people dying in the next big shake, the property was zoned green. So for most people that have gone red, you're on the edge of a cliff, or close to a cliff, and many of the people, most of the people have gone green, are on the right side of the road, or I've got a road between them and the areas that have gone red. Is that, is that so of most of the people in the room? Can I actually just get a hand, a show of hands, people have gone different colour. How many people here have gone green? How many people have gone white? Gone white. I didn't mean to annoy you. Sorry, Phil. <laughs> How many of you here stayed white? How many of you have gone red? So most, most of you are red, are red people. So, so, the red, so, 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 so the red and the green and the, and the cliff collapse stuff was, was, relatively easy, was relatively easy to do. Um, the landslip stuff, um, the landslip stuff, some of those people, I don't know, is anyone here from Lucas Lane here tonight? So the, is there anyone here who was affected by, by landslip and has now gone green? Well, I don't need to talk about that then, that's easy, isn't it? Um, rock roll was a really hard issue. How many of you are affected by rock roll? So there the decision was, if you're, all that information that's been brought together over these last, well, over this last year, was fed into these big models, a bunch of smart engineers worked with these models to work out a life risk line where people had a life risk of worse than one in a thousand um, in the year going forward. And where there was a life risk of worse than one in a thousand, that area went red. The thing that makes it, one of the things that makes it hard with the life risk stuff is the life risk, the seismicity is dropping off, and the seismicity dropping off decreases the life risk. So between now and roughly 2016, the life risk roughly improves by two. So if it was one in a thousand now, it becomes one in two thousand in years in year year 2016. And it's one of those curves that drops off quite quickly to begin with, and then it flattens off a bit. And Jan, I'm not sure if you got, Jan's got some more stuff on that. People whose life risk was, was better than 1 in 5,000, we turned them green. And people whose life risk was better than 1 in 5,000, the modelling says that you'll be better than 1 in 10,000 by 2016, and probably sooner than 2016 if we don't get any big shakes between now and 2016. So you're, you should get through that 1 in 10,000 threshold you know, within a couple of years. The 1 in 10,000 number, which is a number which, we refer, which is referred to a, a lot, um, and I'll, people will talk about it tonight, is a number people generally talk about as being like an acceptable level of life risk. Um, 1 in 10,000 is your chance of dying in a car crash in any year. Um, but and it's about the chances, but it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot lower than the chances of me dying in a year. I'm a, I'm a 47-year-old male, for those of you who couldn't tell. Um, and my chance of dying in, in any year is about 1 in 300. So it actually, be, me living in a house at 1 in 10,000 doesn't change my life risk very much, if you, if you sort of see what I'm trying to say. For my 10-year-old son, his, his risk of dying, in any, and that's 1 in 300 from any cause, cancer, heart attack, um, being knocked off my bicycle, it's 1 in 300. That's the average mortality rate for a, for a male like me. For my 10-year-old son, his, life, his chance of dying in any year from any of those causes is 1 in 10,000. For my 80-year-old dad, it's about 1 in 10. So that life risk thing varies around a lot. But the, if you're like the international experts you bring in to help you think about these sort of issues talk a lot about 1 in 10,000 being the threshold which is, people use internationally as being acceptable and unacceptable. So we've left a bunch of people in the middle between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 5,000, or you can express the 1 in 5,000 as 1 in 10,000 in 2016. I don't, I'm not sitting here trying to 
confuse you, but it's that middle group between one in a thousand now, one in five thousand. We've left them white, and we want to get those answers out by um, 17th of August. And one of the and one of the issues there is can we make remediation work for that group? We think there may be some remediation, which is cost effective. Can we done in a timely fashion? And we'll also we can reassure ourselves is actually going to work. Is actually going to stop rocks coming down the hill. And Jan will talk more about that. But the other sort of issue that really came up quite late was if you weren't one in 5,000 but you won in 4,500, where are we going to turn you red? Because you would eventually reach the one in 5,000 or one in 10,000 just a little bit later than everybody else. And it seemed pretty crazy to be turning people red when given a little bit of time and we've got there. And we just we haven't got our mind around, around that, that issue, which is one reason why you're remaining white at the moment. And I know that doesn't give you answers, but that's, I'm you know, being, being straight with you there. For people who are feeling really pissed off, and I know a lot of people who are white are really pissed off, and there's people here who are red who are really upset as well, we were never going to, I think it would have been a real stretch for that group of people to have ever been turned just, if you like, pure green. You know, I know Phil's sitting there, so hi Phil, you're green now. You know, your life risk is at this level, you know, we, your section 124 notice is gone, have a nice day. I think what might have happened was, well, Phil, um, we're going to build some remediation and you won't be going pure green for another six months or another year, however long it, it takes to get there, to get that, that remediation in place. So I think for people in that middle group, they were, they were probably never going to go pure green last Friday. They were always going to be some sort of a pause, either a pause for me and the powers that be to make up their mind. Well, it would have been nice if Gary Brownlee had stated that there was going to be a white zone in the centre. That wasn't the people. They weren't allowed to know that this is why they were yeah. in Gary's Yeah. I accept that. I accept that. And we were working. So this is all down to communication. Yeah, I accept that. Good. Well, we're here, we're here to try. We're here to. Tr I mean, I can't undo what's happened in the past. I can only tell you what we're going to try and do better in the future, sir. All right. Um, I don't. I don't have. And I, I guess. I guess the last thing I was just going to briefly mention was: there's a, I know there's probably people out there who are um, turned green tonight who don't want to be green, who don't like the rock risks they've got. So we need to find a process of reassuring you about what that rock, what that rock, how bad that rock risk is. And some of you may also want to go into the the, the appeals process that hasn't hasn't yet been formalised. So I haven't got a whole lot more, I haven't got, the last thing I was just going to say in terms of there are also some people who've got a combination of all three issues. They've got cliff collapse nearby, they've got um, landslide issues and they've also got rockfall. And I guess if you fail one of the tests, you know, you go red. Um, passing two of the tests isn't good enough, so to speak. If you fail one of the tests and it's, it's pretty logical, you go red. So I guess I've talked about this, the one in 10,000 thing. The green zone stuff, the acceptable risk, um, red zone, unacceptable risk, and there's a transition for people. And for people who are in that band, there's one in 5,000 now. We think you get to the one in 10,000 by 2016, and probably quicker. Those models that our friends in the science will do change as the risk changes. And if there are no shakes, big shakes between now and then, that risk drops off more quickly, but it doesn't drop fast enough that people are at one in a thousand. We think it ever gets anything like one in 10,000. And now, if that's okay with you, I'll hand over to Jan, and we're gonna try and keep the questions um, question at the end, but welcome to the stage, Jan. Good evening. Sorry, I'm sounding slightly nasal. I'm at the moment fighting with a cold and chronic sleep deprivation. So let's go to some of this one, but we already uh, agreed that there is virtually no one here with lance slippage issues. So I'm just going to keep this one for later on. But essentially what we have over here is the situation more around the Huntsbury Vernon Terrace area, where we actually have lance slippage. If you're coming first to cliff collapse, so I'm going to be talking about cliff collapse, and then after cliff collapse, I'm going to go over the rock crawl. Um, look, if you're looking at actually at the uh, model over here, which is a graphical representation of what has happened, where we have previously in shadowed the um, cliff top, and obviously we have uh, some form of cliff recession. So the cliff recession happened in 
four distinct events. We had um, 22nd of February, which caused some severe land damage and also shaking. We had then um, a little event around April last year, around Easter, which caused small amount of material coming down. Obviously, everybody remembers 13th of June, where a lot of material came down of the cliffs, and in many instances, about four times the amount of material that fell actually in February came down of these cliffs. And the areas most affected were actually um, Richmond Hill and Wakefield Avenue, but to some degree also the little cliffs, which are all over the place over here. So I'm not talking just about the 100 meter tall ones like uh, Whitewash Head or 80 meter uh, high one in Peacock Scallop. I'm talking about the little one in Nayland Street, for example. There's a lot of the smaller coastal cliffs and they failed. What we predicted quite correctly is that during the um, 23rd of um, December, not much material has actually fallen off because the earthquake was slightly more distant. So the magnitude alone doesn't actually um, cause cliff collapse. Very similarly, it doesn't cause rockfall. So what we do know that the threshold to actually um, throw rocks off the cliff side or um, cliffs cause to fail is about 0.4 of G. Okay, to give you about the perception, we have an amplification of the rock. So if we have about uh, 0.2 G out in the floods, we will have between 0.4 G, 0.8 G out over here. And the problem is with a lot of the cliffs is because they're actually nicely spherical. It's a lot like um, whipping a whip. The tail end goes much faster than the front end because the energy gets trapped in the um, cliffs themselves. And the best way to see it is actually in Peacock Scallop, I have an example over here where the cliff did fall off, but the side lobes but also severely damaged by land slippage associated with cleft collapse. In this picture over here, um, what you can see is a representation of the red houses, um, where they are either covered by uh, debris falling off the cliff side, or where there is actually the house halfway already down or affected severely by cracks. Now, to some degree, these cracks can extend only to the soil, and the soil can be between virtually nothing to 15 meters thick on these cliffs, but it also can actually extend to significant depth. The work that GNS has done, especially in these cliffs, they have um, discovered that a lot of slick and siding, which is a technical term for signs of previous slippage, has actually been observed on a lot of the material that came off the hillside. So what we observe right now is probably nothing new. If you're sitting further back, like the greenhouse at the top or the greenhouse down at the bottom, then generally you're either outside the cracking areas, where we actually determine the um, cliff will fail again, or where we modeled the debris avalanche, where you need not reach it. So we have two different processes. We're looking at how the cliff recedes, and we are also looking how the debris is actually transported down slope. And obviously, as the debris um, down is deposited, it changes dramatically. If you can remember, um, Peacock Scallop initially there was very little uh, debris at the bottom. And then February deposited some amount, June a lot of amount, and right now it looks like a ski slope. Hence you have the containers over there. So if you actually go to on the information, that is Peacock Scallop, and roughly um, in yellow, Highlighted is the previous cliff edge. And this aerial photograph was taken in February. That's a 24th of February aerial photograph. So the pink line actually indicates where the debris is at the moment after June. So the run out distance of the debris is significantly larger than after June, uh, sorry, after February. And as you can see, um, towards the uh, left-hand side, you can see the debris already encroaches very closely to the containers. And that's one of the reasons why the containers, which are actually the black and white dots, are actually placed over there. So that's what happens now down at the bottom. Now if we come to the top, the first thing you notice, there's a lot of yellow lines. Now these are actually cracks larger than um, about that much. Okay, so we have not actually recorded every single pavement crack that was on the hills, but only those ones that we deemed significant enough to be recorded and associated with cliff collapse. 
Now, as the material actually got cracked uh, into the rock below and actually shaken, the blue areas indicate the areas that actually start to slide down slope. So the areas on the right hand side I think, encompasses a lot of the Clifton Avenue all the way to the intersection of Kinsey Terrace. And that is where uh, we had the survey monitoring in place for after uh, February and June confirmed that this block moved on mass. So if you look actually in the middle of the block there is very little cracking. And that's a fairly typical for, for larger mass movement areas where the middle actually moves like a big ice shelf without breaking up and a lot of damage is concentrated on the outside. That might not be repeated the next time around. If you're looking on the other side, you can see an extensive cracking there as well and a lot of the properties actually experience significant damage there as well. I'm not quite sure if you can see it from the back, I certainly can't see it at the moment on the projector, but there are little red dotted lines. The first dotted line is the best estimate from uh, both GNS, the Portals Geotechnical Group, and our international peer reviewer, that when we have a repeat of June event, where the cliff will be the next time around. Okay? The second line, which is closer to the first line, is if that happens, then over the next 50 years we expect that the cliff will erode to that point, because right now it is over steep. Alternatively, you can see the other way around, the cliff will erode to the first red dotted line, and then after 50 years we might have an earthquake, it will actually then fall off to that place. Now, if I actually right now overlay the zoning decisions with this, you can see how congruent actually it is. So that is in terms of a cliff collapse for Peacock's Gallop. Obviously, we're in Sumner right now, so I rotate myself by 300 degrees, and actually looking at um, the cliff above Richmond Hill. Okay, so again what we have over here, we have um, the access road to the top of Richmond Hill, we have um, the containers again um, in black and white dotted lines, and we have the talus extent as observed after June. Now one thing to remember in this cliff is it didn't fail in February, but in June, we have the talus right now to this extent. So remember what I told you about Peacock's Gallop. The next time it shakes, we expect about four times the amount of material. It's a cubic relationship that will actually deposit. Hence the containers are in the place where they will, uh, currently are. The top is slightly different geology than Peacock's Gallop. Peacock's Gallop has a lot of lusial soils on top of it, which is commonly refers to clay. So it dampens a lot of the cracking. The top of Richmond Hill is more made of rock, and the rock extensively cracked, and it's actually comparable to a cap. And the cap got shaken, cracked apart, and you can see a lot of the cracks are parallel to the uh, cliff edge. To some degree, we have the um, cliff recessions lined this way uh, as well, and in blue again, the landsliding. So if you actually look in this instant on the zoning decisions, where we indicated red, there's a life safety issue. In the top left hand corner, you can see some degree of cracking, or land movement, but the distance between the current cliff and where we expect the cliff to potentially be after 50 years, there's still more than sufficient land that these uh, properties are actually not affected by cliff collapse. And hence, there will be no different to many other land slippage areas on the Port Hills. So that's about a cliff collapse. If you actually right now turn to Rockfall, I again um, took a slight representation of this. The thing to realize in the Port Hills, and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about it, we don't have actually like in Europe one or two nice distinct bluffs or rock sources. We have many of them one on top of each other. The material is also different. It actually is made from volcanic material. So um, we have two types of uh, rocks up there. The rock that actually shatters and breaks up into small bits, and the stuff which is generally the um, columnar lava, it doesn't break up. It actually stays in either a suitcase, washing machine, or Land Rover sized bits as they travel down the slope. Now as the material starts to bounce down slope, 
the majority of the material actually retained close to the slope. So if you actually right now measure how many rocks from the valley all the way to the top, you will find that most of the rocks are closer to the source. And as you walk down towards the valley, the frequency, the number of rocks for any given area reduces. That generally is the rule. So if you're looking at the three houses over here, the green houses are in an area where rocks might have reached it. And in some instances, there will be areas which um, the actually had rockfall impact. Probably not once, but twice, okay? Or multiple times. We have then an area which we have left white. And this is an area I'm going to be talking um, in the next slide about risk. And then we have closer to the source areas that actually had multiple impact strikes where the boulders are generally of larger size. And there's not one or two, but dozens of them coming around. So if you keep this one in mind, I was going to talk first about the seismic hazard model. Now what we need to understand is what drives boulders downslope. In the model, GNS has provided for us for the zoning decisions. We essentially um, assume that the seismicity will reduce with time. So this is your good news over here. So the chance of another February, June event or a large earthquake reduces with time. So at the moment, this graph has been uh, plotted from 1st of January 2012 and increases in annual um, steps up to 2020 or uh, 42, where we expect that the seismicity will return roughly to the new background levels. So the highest risk a year after the event now has already been passed. We had a lot of reduction in risk, okay? Now, if I'm talking about the risk before I'm going how these curves decay and what they mean, let me explain first of all annual individual fatality risk. Roger mentioned about it very briefly, but it is actually a chance of any individual in the society dying in any given year, okay? What does it mean? There are 400 people in New Zealand using the dying on the roads, or we have 4 million people in New Zealand using the roads. So 400 over 4 million gives you 1 in 10,000. So NZTA invests a lot into educational sessions, into campaigns, into road safety to keep the number that low. If you go to I will probably be hammered for this, but say Nigeria or Kenya or Sao Paulo and use the ro ro roading system over there, the, your life safety risk will be higher. It could be one in 5,000, could be one in 1,000, or it could be actually as high as one in 100. Okay? So it actually relates to the number of fatalities in a population per any given year. So it is a number risk experts, not geotechnical experts, but the risk experts use to determine how any individual is exposed to life safety risks in their normal environment. Now, some of you go for mountain climbing. You expose yourself to about a risk of about one in a hundred, but you receive directly a benefit out of this one because you get the thrill to actually go up to Mount Cook. Some of you engaged into uh, professions that have a much higher life safety risk. Roger always used the crop duster pilot example. We have, I think, one in 50, the 50 crop duster pilot, and on any given year, about one bites the dust. Okay? So you can make examples out of this one, but for occupation of houses, about one in 10,000 is in the Western world. Um, generally the accepted life safety risk criteria. Other countries such as Netherlands um, using one in a hundred thousand. Generally the life safety risk acceptance criteria for children is much higher at about one in a million. Okay? Now, what we actually see right now, and I'm going to go to the bottom graph which actually shows a graphics, what we mean with a shadow angle. Now if you go to the bottom of the cliff, we actually um, have project a line down to the bottom of the valley. So let me demonstrate it. We are roughly over here. This area up here is the cliff or the bluff. And from this point downwards, we project at 21 degrees 
down to a point in the valley. Or let me uh, do it the other way around. If you actually raise your hand at about 21 degrees and walk towards uh, the valley, the first bluff you actually encounter at the bottom of it, that's 21 degrees. The mapping on the Port Hills, looking at other examples in um, China, India, um, Europe, New, uh, and North America indicate about 21 degrees is where we expect rocks to roll to. And about 95th percentile, that was true. About more than 95th percentile of the rocks actually stopped at about that li line in the Port Hills. The 5%, there might be gullies, there might be other influencing factors. So that's 21 degrees. Now, if we're actually going closer up the slope, the angle gets sharper, steeper. Oops. The angle gets much sharper and steeper. So over here could be 23 degrees, 25 degrees, and then closer to the source is 29 degrees. Okay? Now, the number of rocks closer to the source will be higher. And that's reflected, actually, on your annual individual fatality risk. So closer to the cliff, which is the blue line, we actually have a higher life safety risk. The risk reduces dramatically if you're actually further away from the bluff. That's the first information out of this graph. Second, as you can see, the lines drop down. So as the lines drop down, that's actually the effect of seismicity. And the seismicity is what drives the boulders out of the hillside. So we assumed, based on GNS advice, that about two-thirds of the contribution to rockfall is due to seismicity, and the seismicity reduces with time. So if you can see over here, in about a year 2022, the seismicity reduces significantly to what we have it at the moment. Okay, so there's both a spatial component, where you are, relating to the rock source, and then there's a temporal component, where in time you are actually within the rock source. So this information was fed into the risk model, which included uh, things like occupation of a home, the likelihood of um, someone being actually present, and the likelihood of someone actually being killed. So this is a mathematical formulation, and out of that was fed directly into the zoning information. Now, you can see, first of all, here two different reds. So in the bottom right-hand corner, we have actually the cliff collapse red. So these properties are actually affected by cliff collapse. And again, we're not talking over here about the 100-meter tall cliffs. We're talking about the 15, 20-meter cliffs, very similar to Nayland Street. So that was um, based on advice from GNS. The dark maroon colors is actually the um, rockfall risk, which is greater or worse than one in a thousand currently present. And as Roger indicated, the risk will diminish with time. But because we're talking about a logarithmic scale, even doubling it and quadrupling it, will actually not bring it up to a life safety acceptance criteria of one in a thousand. So if you're in this area, say one in a thousand today, in five years time, you will be only one in two thousand. Another five years then, you will only be possibly as good as one in four thousand. That was a criteria used for red zoning on the Port Hills for, rock, uh, for Rockfall. On the green, the, it's the other side of the coin. Um, the line was plotted where the current life safety risk is 1 in 5,000. And because it's a logarithmic relationship, doubling 1 in 5,000 in five years' time, it's going to be 1 in 10,000. And in white, or in this case gray, are the intermediate areas between 1 in 1,000 now and 1 in 5,000 now, which actually will become 1 in 10,000 in 2016. Now, as Roger indicated, the white areas over the next six weeks, the geotechnical engineers will look at the different issues. First of all, how does the risk diminish with further in time. So GNS have been asked to split the model, not just in five-year gaps, but in annual 
dips. Just to see whether it's going to be 2016, 2017, or 2014 when a certain property um, gets into life safety acceptance criteria. That's number one. Number two, as Roger indicated, we will look very closely at protective works. At the moment, protective works have not been considered, again, for the red zone areas, because what we actually do see that protective works can reduce up to a maximum of one order of magnitude the life safety risk for rockfall. And that's the best case scenario. Okay? So if you're in less than a one in ten one in thousand, one order of magnitude is just about one in thousand. Uh, one in ten thousand, sorry for that. Now, the one problem with um, protective works is very, very simple. Initially, a lot of people believed it's relatively straightforward. We had companies over here advising us. We we're working still very closely with them. The problem is that on the port hills, the rocks are driven seismic, uh, seismically. So the earthquakes is what triggers the rocks, and to a lesser degree, the rainfall and the natural events like uh, erosion or the goat actually pushing against it. So the earthquakes are driving it, we have strong earthquakes which actually harvest multiple rocks. We're not talking about tens or dozens, we're talking about hundreds of rocks. Each side of the valley, I had about 500 rocks falling down. So if you're looking at rockfall protection, the advice we've been given from specialists around the world is that in the areas that are actually maroon shaded, they are very unlikely to work. We're working very closely with them, both Sierra and Crash City Council and GNS, to determine how and what will work. Certainly, bunts have a much higher resistance, but in, for example, in um, the northern side of Wakefield Avenue, constructing a bunt is very difficult because slopes are more than 20 degrees steep. You simply cannot construct a bunt in there, which is geotechnically very, very difficult. But I'm going to explain to you to some degree how the decisions have been driven. So if you hang on with me, and I'm just focusing at the moment on the northern side of um, Sumner. Uh, sorry, no, I'll just have it on the, the western side of Sumner. So in red are all the boulders that were actually logged by the uh, Port Hills Geotechnical Group. Now, these are not all the boulders that has fallen down. These are the results from the 3D analysis, which we have engaged um, in Sierra, a specialist company, GeoVert, to do it for us with the University of Milan, and a specialist company in Austria, which specializes on rockfall protection. So the first thing you can see is the different colors. The different colors actually symbolize the different frequency of rocks coming down in certain areas. Because we actually dislodge a high number of rocks, we will have high number of fluxes. The darker the color, the more rocks actually falling down. So you can see over here, it does correlate very well with actually where we have. This analysis was run blind without actually the rocks being present first. So it's just correlation between what has happened and what we have observed in the numerical modeling. Overlaid on top of it is um, the current zone decisions. So the one slide in between actually shows then obviously the risk and the risk over here you can very clearly see is where there's a large number of boulders the likelihood of any one being struck in their home is very very high. Hence it, uh, the life safety risk is very very high. That formed then the uh, zoning, which currently is what we actually have a zoning decision. It's not pink, it's red, unfortunately. And in summary, that's actually how, based on example, the reminder of the Port Hills were actually zoned. So I capped the effectiveness of rockfall protection and actually walked you to the um, rock roll and rock fall. So I'm handing right now over to the mayor and happily taking questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. So just very briefly, uh, one of the responsibilities that Council has in this process is for the Section 124. Those, it's one of the least uh, enjoyable tasks that we have to administer, but it comes to us through 
uh, legislation and specifically under the RMA when it comes to uh, the sort of geotechnical issues that we're facing on the hills. So we are responsible for managing those. And we issue the notices based on two basic reasons. One would be if there is a, a geotechnical hazard and the other one is if there's a structural hazard in the building uh, itself. And most of the issues that we'll be talking about here are associated with those natural geotechnical hazards. So um, the quick overview of what has happened, if you've been rezoned from white to green, uh, then the uh, 124 notice is removed immediately. So if it's because of one of those natural hazards, there, there may be some cases in existing green zones where there are buildings with section 124s, generally that is going to be because of some sort of structural hazard in the building itself. If you were rezoned from white to red, uh, then the uh, notices that were there obviously will remain in place. And in fact, because of that reassessment of the risk, council will have to go in and reassess buildings. So it is possible uh, within a red zone that there could be an, an additional 124. Uh, and that simply means that the level of immediate life risk is such that it is the view that you should not be in that building. It should not be occupied. For the places that are now white or in the remaining white zone, we have 114 notices in place there. Uh, we may need to put more of those notices in place, uh, and that will be as a result of the continuous and ongoing assessment that we're uh, going to be doing in the weeks ahead. Uh, and as I said, there are some places already in the existing green zones. Thank you. Uh, this actually has ramifications much further out as well in the areas where we've identified the risk that's been talked about here tonight, where the risk profile probably will never get up to even the one in 5,000 area. It means that those areas effectively will be areas that we will want to rezone. If they are residential at present, they are unlikely to be uh, rezoned or be, be residential going into the future, and obviously that impacts on the civil defence plans that we are responsible as well. So government will be responding at some point with some additional order and council driven legislation that will actually enable us to draw some uh, new lines on the maps. We are continuously up there re-evaluating the situations. If you've got a 124, it's on average once every six weeks that a re-evaluation of that property will be uh, carried out. The Safer Christchurch Infrastructure Rebuild team are, are definitely involved in this whole process as well. They're carrying out work to repair and stabilise in areas where we've got uh, our lifelines. They're the roads, uh, they're the, uh, the water and the wastewater systems as well. And they've got a great website if you haven't been to it already. Uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. It breaks down into your areas, what work is proposed, what work is actually underway, and, and what work has been completed. When it comes to the issue of costs, which has uh, suddenly leapt into the media today, uh, despite uh, what has been said, there has been no final deal on costs at the moment. The Minister's press release that came out on Friday, I think, said that Council and Government will share the costs 50-50. Uh, but that hasn't been uh, agreed with Council. Uh, the normal split in this sort of situation is actually around 60-40, but again, uh, that's not been agreed, and that'll be a discussion for work ongoing. Why are we paying for any of this stuff? Uh, when on the flat, uh, we're not involved in those settlements, and the simple answer is natural hazards. Uh, on the flat, EQC is there to sort out the land under your property, if it is damaged and needs repair. As you've just seen through Jan's presentation, the issue here are hazards that aren't necessarily on your property. For example, the uh, properties that are affected by cliff collapse, they are covered 100% by government. But in the area where there is rock roll, those areas are an area where council has, through the Resource Management Act, the job to remedy or mitigate any of those sorts of uh, dangers 
and therefore we share in the costs of that part. So those discussions are ongoing. We've actually provisioned about $55 million in our budget. Uh, whichever way you cut it, it's going to cost a bit more than that on the basis of the figures that we've got at the moment. And that's something we'll have to uh, work through. We've got uh, a team over here from the City Council. Uh, Ethan's here, who really is the source of the best knowledge on that. He'll be available at the table over there later on to take you through those areas. One of the questions that people ask us is what happens if I get a section 124 on my property? What do I have to do? And fundamentally it means that the life risk has been assessed to be as high as imminent danger. And in that case, you're in, it's, the intention is that you would evacuate that property uh, immediately. Now you can dispute that call. If you don't think it's right, you can go to the Department of Building and Housing and they will reassess it. If you're not satisfied with, out, that, with that outcome, if it goes against what you believe uh, should be the outcome, you can actually take it to court and contest it there. And unfortunately, Council will have to enforce the 124s, uh, and that's not uh, anything we can question. It's basically our legitimate legal duty, and we have to do that. It's not a pleasant process. No one is looking forward to it, least of all the people in the properties, and the people in our organisation do not enjoy this duty at all. So if we can help you understand the process and you have further questions, I recommend that you come and join us at the table on the side of the room. So uh, we're now going to move into another area, which is support and assistance. And we're also going to look at the packages that are available for those of you who have now been uh, found yourselves in a red zone. What are the offers? So, Ivan, I'll get you to take us through that part. Ladies and gentlemen, Ivan Yafeta, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Good evening. I'm going to talk about the Crown offer that is available to residential red zone property owners shortly. Uh, but given the significance of the zoning decisions and the impact on people's lives, what I'd like to do before I get into the offer um, framework is talk about the support and assistance that is available to people, not only to assist you through the Crown offer process, but also to assist with any earthquake-related matters that you may be facing or any of those challenges. There are a number of face-to-face -face services that are available, and I've spoken them, about them at a lot of the community meetings. The first is that we have an earthquake assistance centre. It is located a fair distance from here uh, at the Avondale Golf Course. And at the earthquake assistance cent uh, centre, there are representatives not only from Sarah, but also from the EQC, uh, from insurance companies, from the Christchurch City Council, from community law, uh, from the temporary accommodation service, and also the earthquake support coordinators. And they are all available in one location for people should you wish to discuss uh, any of those matters face to face, rather than dealing with 0800 numbers. Now, acknowledging that that is quite a distance from the Port Hills areas, we are also working with uh, the Port Hills leaders, the strategy group, to identify some alternative options for basing those services in your local community. Now, once we have those uh, locations finalised, the information will be on the CERA website next week to explain where some of those services will be available within the local community, and that will include representatives of CERA as well. I also just want to touch briefly on uh, the Earthquake Support Coordination Service, uh, the Canterbury Support Line, the Kaitahu Support Line, and also uh, Temporary Accommodation. Uh, the Temporary Accommodation Service was established uh, after the September earthquake and came into being uh, in February, and they provide three key functions or services that are available to people. The first is in assisting property owners or even tenants to find alternative temporary accommodation. And in acknowledging that a lot of people who are property owners haven't been in the property market or looking for alternative accommodation, they will work with you to identify the options that are available to you in identifying alternative accommodation. The second component of their service is the administration of the financial assistance package that was announced by the government uh, last year, which is the subsidy towards accommodation costs for people. Now that is based on the family uh, type that you may have, whether you're a single person, uh, a couple with or without children, or perhaps a larger family. 
and there are set rates for that uh, subsidy that is available. But the key thing to note is that the assistance is available at the end of whatever accommodation allowance you may be receiving uh, from your insurance company. And it's an allowance or a subsidy that is not income or asset tested. So it is, there is a universal entrance criteria for the temporary accommodation allowance from the Crown. The third component of the service uh, is also a, to provide a connection to the Earthquake Support Coordination Service. Now, it's sometimes difficult to explain what the Earthquake Support Coordination Service is or for people to understand fully how the service can assist people work through uh, challenges that they may be facing in relation to insurance, uh, to legal matters, uh, to accommodation or financial matters. So on most, if not all, of the seats around you, there is a uh, Earthquake Support Coordination Service uh, flyer or one-pager which has in there a number of scenarios and a description of how the earthquake support coordinators can assist people who are facing some of the earthquake related challenges. So uh, if you've got that there, hopefully that will explain to you what the service is. But in essence, it's a uh, government funded service to provide, uh, including the Kaitoko Whanau service, up to 72 professionals who are available to assist you to understand and work your way through any of the earthquake related challenges or matters that you may be facing. And again, there are a number of staff that are here with us tonight and they're just on my left over here. Most of the staff have the blue vests on and they'll be more than happy to help or assist you after the meeting. Uh, the third thing uh, that I just want to touch on tonight is the Canterbury support line. And that's been available since immediately following the September earthquake. It is a free confidential service through an 0800 number and I know that I'm currently talking about a number of 0800 numbers, but if you picked up oops, one of the How We Can Help brochures, which is at the back uh, behind the Sierra stand where the Crown offer is, it does include a summary of all of the information that I'm talking to you about briefly tonight. So please make sure you take one of those with you because it has a lot of information around the support and assistance that is available. But the Canterbury support line can link you into a number of free counselling services that may be appropriate either for yourself or if not for yourself, you might want to consider this information for a family member uh, or for one of your neighbours. Uh, and finally, there is the Kaituhu, Kaitahu support line, uh, which is a service not just for Māori, but it's funded through uh, Te Pune Kōkiri, uh, through Hio Rangu Panamu, to fund work, people here in the local community, again, to provide the assistance and support uh, that focuses on people's wellbeing and assisting them through the earthquake recovery process. So again, all of that information that I've just talked about is in the brochure, so please, if you haven't got one, make sure that you take one with you. Uh, for owners of properties that have been zoned red, the government will be extending uh, an offer to insured residential property owners, to not-for-profit uh, property owners, and also to owners of partially constructed properties. But I also want to acknowledge that there are a number of other property owners within the areas that have been zoned red for which the Crown has yet to make a decision to finalise uh, the offers that will be available for those types of properties. And they include owners of commercial properties, any owners of uh, vacant residential land, and also uh, any of the uninsured properties. So decisions still yet to be made by the Crown around those property types in terms of eligibility for a Crown offer and exactly what that offer will involve. But I would expect that those decisions will be forthcoming uh, within the next sort of two to four weeks. There is a uh, fact sheet or a, a piece of information. Uh, it's an A3 piece of information, which again is available from the table at the back under the Crown Offer um, banner, which sets out the two options that are available for people in more information than that which is up on the slide at the moment. But in essence, the Minister indicated in his uh, media release last week that residential property owners in the red zone will be extended an offer based on the latest ratings valuation, which in, Christ, in Christchurch is the 2007 ratings valuation. And there are two options that are available for property owners to consider, in addition to or alongside of whatever their insurance company offers may be. The offers from the Crown work uh, in two different ways. So the first one is where the Crown makes an offer for the purchase of the entire property at the current capital ratings value and that's less any insurance uh, payments that you may have already received for damage to your house. The Crown then assumes all of the insurance claims other than contents. So basically summarising, the payment is for the full capital ratings valuation 
and in accepting option one, you then assign all of the insurance uh, claims that you may have for damage to your house, dwelling and land to the Crown. Now, if you've received payments for any emergency repairs, those are not deducted. The second option that's available for property, insured residential property owners to consider is where the Crown makes an offer of purchase for the entire property at the current land uh, rating value only. Less any insurance payments for land damage that you may have already received, which is probably unlikely at this stage. And then you continue to deal with your insurance company about your home. Now, generally speaking, uh, based on those two offers, if your home is a total loss or a complete rebuild and the value of the damage that your insurance company is, is looking at making an offer to you based on is greater than the uh, improvements value in your ratings valuation, then generally option two is the better option for you. If the insurance company, your insurance company and or EQC is looking at settling your claim based on uh, minimal damage only, then option one might be the better option for you, which is the full ratings valuation. But what we do encourage people to do is get really, really good independent legal advice. You might want to talk to your insurance company and or EQC as well, and also talk to some family uh, and friends and also the leaders that are available within the community. Now, full details uh, of, the, of the offer themselves for elig eligible red zoned property owners will be finalised shortly. Um, but in general, as I said at the beginning, uh, insured residential property owners, owners of partially built properties, uh, and also not-for-profits are eligible for the offer currently. And there are still some decisions to be made by Cabinet about commercial um, vacant land and also uninsured. What we do have available tonight at the desk at the back of the hall are consent forms. Now, a consent form isn't a binding contract between yourself and Sarah, but if you are considering the Crown offer, or you want to understand how the Crown offer applies to your individual property, the consent form uh, allows Sarah to talk to EQC and your insurer, and also to the Christchurch City Council to understand what the ratings value is for your property, and also for us to then validate and confirm with insurers what insurance payments may have already been made. Now, generally speaking, for property owners in the flat zone where decisions have already been made, once you've returned a consent form, the turnaround time for us to prepare the offer, ensure that it's accurate and correct, and to send that back out to you, is generally about two to four weeks. So if you want to kickstart that process at the moment, there are consent forms that are available here tonight. If you have all of the information, then we're happy to take the consent forms from you tonight. Uh, but please also feel free to take the consent forms away with you, and you can return those to us either by post, uh, you can drop them into the Earthquake Assistance Centre, or once we've finalised the details of the outreach services in your local community, uh, then you can also take them along there and that'll kickstart the process and mean that we can start formulating what the offer will be. But I just want to reiterate again that signing a consent form doesn't commit you or obligate you in any way to accept any of the offers from the Crown. Now, we have had feedback already from people tonight that getting offers out to property owners by the end of August is a long time. And in the interim, you still have costs that you have to meet in order to pay mortgages, etc. So what we will be working hard to ensure is that we get those offers out as soon as, as, as we possibly can. And as, if we can do that earlier, if, we can humanly, if it's humanly possible to do that, then we will be doing that as quickly as we can. The details of the offer, once they've been finalised and signed off by Cabinet, will be available on the CERA website. We expect to have that up within about the next two to four weeks. Uh, and uh, the information will include what the purchase offer will or will not be for, timeframes for considering the offer, and also what the final settlement date will be. So those details have yet to be finalised, but we're hoping to have that within the next couple of weeks. If you take a consent form away tonight and you fill that out and send it back to us, what that means is that once all of that information is finalised and agreed to by Cabinet, we will write to you straight away with the offer details as it applies to your individual property. If you don't want to fill out a consent form, then the information will be available on the website. You can also call us on 0800 ring Sarah within a couple of, you know, within about two to four weeks time, and we will provide you with all of the information regarding the Crown offer that has been agreed to. Uh, so just summarising very quickly, we have consent forms here tonight. There is a lot of information that is available uh, in the uh, booth at the back, 
and there are also earthquake support coordinators and a number of other services that are available to assist you through the process. We'll also work with the community leaders, the Port Hill Strategy Group, to understand and to plan uh, for a follow-up workshop for those property owners who want to know more about the Crown offer once those, those details have been finalised. And again, happy to take questions at the end of this meeting, or if you have any individual questions and you want to talk um, about your individual circumstances, then myself and a number of other staff from CERA will be available at the meeting if you want to talk one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So that's the Red Zone offer. I'll now hand over to Roger, who's going to sum up. Thank you. So just, I think just to make sure people understand that while the government and the council haven't agreed on how anything's going to be cost shared, the offer is going to come from the government. So you don't need to worry about that in terms of you getting your red zone offer. Um, I'd really just like to reiterate what um, Ivan said about making sure you do get good quality independent advice. Um, for many of you, this is um, the biggest financial transaction you'll, you may ever do. And you need to make sure you've got good advice before you actually go forward. Um, community law have free legal advice, there's various other people offering advice out there. You need to take your time, this is actually a very, very big deal about what you're about to get into. Um, but just to really sum up, um, we want to get the white zone decision out as quickly as we can. The Minister's committed to do that by um, August the 17th. Um, these decisions have very much been around life risk. Um, I know a lot of you don't like the decisions, but that's where the decisions are. But there will also be an appeal mechanism as well, and we'll have to work out exactly what that looks like and publish that just as quickly as we're able to. Um, and I guess, I, look, I can't, these are really difficult times for a lot of people. You need to make sure you are getting the support you need. Um, the earthquake support coordinators are working with a wide range of people at the moment to help them. They know where the best support services are, and I'd really... I'd really encourage you to see them if you do think you need help or, or give them a ring or give them a ring via us. So with that, Bob, shall I hand, I hand it back to you, Bob, and we can get on with some questions.